Is your cloud bill out of control? Cloud Zero is building a platform that will let you analyze your cloud investment faster than ever before. You'll get accurate, granular visibility into your total cloud spend without the typical pitfalls of legacy cloud cost management tools like endless tagging or clunky Kubernetes support. Cloud Zero is how cloud driven companies gain more financial control and predictability by driving immediate and ongoing savings. You can answer questions like How can I save 20% of my cloud bill right now? Who are my most expensive customers? How much does this specific feature cost our business? Join companies like Rapid7, Drift, and SeatGeek by visiting cloudzero.com slash cloudcast to get started today. Again, please visit cloudzero.com slash cloudcast to get started today. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina, getting towards the end of October 2023, another Sunday Perspective show. And a couple of things uh, before we get started with this show. Next week's show will actually be a little bit different from a Sunday Perspective. Uh, Aaron and I are both going to be on the show, probably first time we've ever done a Sunday Perspective together. Uh, We have a bunch of new things that we're going to announce about the show, some formatting things, some uh, structure of the show, a bunch of things that we've been talk- thinking about for a while that we just felt like uh, now was the right time to get to. So while today will be a normal Sunday perspective, next week, uh, you know, will be kind of a, a new perspective on the Cloudcast from a Sunday perspective's perspective. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll go through some, some of the new things that'll be happening starting in November. So just keep an eye out for that one. Today, what I want to kind of dig into was there was a really interesting article uh, in the new stack written by one of the original members of Docker looking at kind of the 10 year anniversary of the company Docker and the project Docker and kind of looking at three things that they got right and three things that they got wrong. And I'm not going to review the article. I'll put the article in the show notes. I actually did a Sunday perspective, one of the very first Sunday perspectives we did uh, back in 2021 about uh, kind of a an outsider's view of Docker, kind of Docker the company, Docker the project, um, what it was like when you were you know in that community uh, in the early days, and as Aaron and I were. Uh, you know, it's one of the earliest projects I think that Aaron and I were involved with, earliest communities that Aaron and I were involved with from a Cloudcast perspective, uh, attending the events, uh, you know, talking to a lot of the different companies that were involved with Docker. Um, so if you want to go back and listen to that one, it's uh, from 2021. I think it still holds up pretty well. But the, the, sh- the article this week I thought was really interesting, and I don't really want to review the article. I'll put a link in the show notes to it. But I thought it was really interesting because it highlighted a number of things that I think when you look back historically and then you look at where we are today, uh, 10 years is a pretty good time frame. It's a pretty good milestone to try and look at, you know, what did we learn? Uh, what came out of Docker? Because Docker was a very interesting technology. It was an interesting company. It was an interesting community framework at the time. Um, and it, while we think of it as very foundational to a lot of things that people do today in terms of using containers. As a company, it was unusual in a number of ways that I'm going to kind of dig into after the break. Um, And I think a number of the things that Docker was maybe trying to do, whether they tried to do it or not, um, you know, did influence a number of things that happened over the last 10 years. Uh, But they've also, as they talk about in in this article, there was also a number of things that they never really broke through. And I don't know if the community as a whole or companies that were trying to play in the cloud native ecosystem figured out as a whole. And so what I want to try and do after the break is dig into a bunch of the things around that and try and look at some of the lessons that were learned from not just Docker, uh, but the Docker way of doing business, uh, the way that communities evolved since Docker, and kind of where we are today, um, you know, given some of the announcements from various companies since then. So we're going to get to that after the break. Today's show is sponsored by Panoptica. Panoptica provides users with deep visibility, prioritized risk assessment, and actionable remediation from development to runtime. This comprehensive cloud-native application protection platform provides an essential, holistic view to secure the entire cloud application stack seamlessly. With the integration of security into the DevOps and CI-CD pipelines, Panoptica fosters a security-first culture and allows users to detect and resolve security issues at every stage of the development lifecycle. To get more information on Panoptica, visit panoptica.app. That's panoptica.app. 
Datadog is a SaaS cloud monitoring and security platform that enables full stack observability for modern infrastructure and applications at any scale. Providing teams dashboarding, alerting, application performance monitoring, infrastructure monitoring, UX monitoring, security monitoring, and log management in one tightly integrated platform, plus 450 plus out of the box integrations with technologies including cloud providers, databases, and web servers. Aggregate all your data into one platform for seamless correlation, enabling teams to troubleshoot and collaborate together in one place, preventing downtime and enhancing performance and reliability. Get started with a free 14-day trial by visiting datadog.com slash cloudcast. That's datadog.com slash cloudcast. And we're back. And uh, great to be back with all of you, as I talked about at the top of the show. Um, You know, we want to dive into kind of a a 10-year look back but also a where are we today, uh, not just at Docker, but the things that Docker kicked off as a company, uh, what containers kicked off in terms of the technology, what happened with uh, communities in the Docker world versus communities, how they evolved since then, and then really kind of look at you know what, what really came out of that from a progress perspective over the last 10 years as to where we are today. And have we made much progress in reality or did we go through a lot of change and we're sort of back to where we are right now? So let me dig into a number of things. So obviously, like I said, go back and listen to that show from 2021 uh, where I do kind of a rundown of Docker in terms of the company, where it got started from, uh, the rise of Docker, sort of the fall of Docker, where they are as of 2021. Um, but as I think back on it, Docker was was really an interesting company because it was – it was kind of a transition. It was a transition between where we distinctly thought infrastructure was very separate from application development, right? We were we were kind of coming from a stage of people were, you know, they were building applications, but they tended to be monolith or sort of three-tiered applications. The infrastructure tended to be uh, virtual machines. We, you know, we'd kind of gone through almost a, a decade, if you will, or seven or eight years of VMware. And we suddenly sort of went through a bunch of change all of a sudden. So we had um, we had OpenStack and we had AWS coming along trying to disrupt the VMware world, the infrastructure world. At the time, AWS was very infrastructure centric. Uh, OpenStack was trying to create an open source uh, alternative to that. And so we had the first sort of iteration of a, a huge, huge chunk of something we did every day. And, and I shouldn't say the first, you know, there were things like MySQL that were trying to disrupt Oracle and, and some other things. But, you know, for, for sort of mainstream IT, this felt like one of the very first times that, uh, you know, we were, we were going through this. And so OpenStack sort of kicked it off. They were trying to create some sort of hybrid thing between VMware proprietary and AWS proprietary and trying to be, you know, a cloud that, that was open source. Um, it tried to do community a certain way. And then Docker came along and Docker was obviously trying to, you know, take from not infrastructure as service, but they were taking from platform as a service. They had been dot cloud before. They were taking some of that technology. They were trying to open source it. They were trying to build a community around it. They were one of the first ones, I shouldn't say one of the first ones, but one of the most visible ones trying to you know, enable developers in this new sort of way of building applications in which we were building microservices. We were trying to uh, decentralize applications, sort of decouple applications from the, the standard sort of three-tier uh, monolithic uh, f- framework or pattern. Um, and it was, you know, one of the first technologies that felt like it sort of blurred the lines between like, is this an infrastructure company or, you know, infrastructure technology, or is this, you know, sort of app dev developer, uh, you know, technology. So it, it, it sort of lived somewhere between the, the things that, that the AWSs and OpenStacks were trying to do. Eventually, Kubernetes came along. I've done some shows about Kubernetes. I'll put that in the show notes as well. But Docker was kind of at this inflection point of those things, right? So that was the first thing that that jumped out at me was they were very much a technology that was at a time when people were trying to do stuff very different. The rules were very different. There was, you know, not sort of distinctly, uh, you know, infrastructure and, and, you know, IT ops and security all in one bucket and, and app dev in another. They were, you know, one of the very first companies that was very visible in a very different business model of, 
you know, trying to, to blur those things together because the thought process was in order to be able to do this stuff faster, more nimble, more agile, more frequently changing, you needed to do stuff differently than you did before. So that was the sort of the first thing. The second thing that was very interesting was Docker was also one of the early companies, one of the first companies that you kind of, you know, at the time they were very much all about saying, look, we're an open source community. We are, we are, we're, you know, we're trying to build community. But if you look back on it, it kind of didn't meet that one criteria, which was, you know, was there lots of contributors that had a say in where the project was going? Yes, there was contributors and there were people doing stuff with it, but ultimately the Docker company had the most say over Docker. Um, so was it a community or, you know, looking back on it, was it more, this is a terrible world, you know, word, but like, was it more like a cult? Were you part of the cult of Docker? Because from a community perspective, it wasn't sort of the, the, the normal, everybody participates, everybody can equally share in this. It, it felt very much like, I shouldn't say a cult, it felt more like a proprietary company that happened to now have this sort of open source software. And so again, Docker was in that weird mold of people like to compare it to VMware because it was kind of doing infrastructure sort of stuff. Um, and you know, the patterns of its community followed a lot of what VMware did, where a lot of people were using it. They were finding multiple use cases. It was touching a lot of different technology elements. It was touching compute, but it was starting to touch networking and storage and security. And, um, you know, it was kind of infrastructure you know, was it, it was a thing that you used to package applications. So it, it felt like VMware, it kind of built communities like VMware, where, you know, the, the central company was kind of dictating where the roadmaps were going, where the future was going, where the messaging was going. And so it it, it it wasn't exactly your standard open source community. And that ultimately became one of its one of its sort of downfalls, if you will, or one of its major roadblocks. But that part was different. And then, you know, like I mentioned, Docker was sort of stuck somewhere between are we an infrastructure company or are we sort of helping app dev? And I don't think they did that on purpose. I think they were like, well, the way to, to get to get there, and, and this was, you know, kind of a commonly uh, beginning to be a commonly held belief was you had to live, you know, sort of in this blurred areas. If you, if you were just trying to replace something that was in an old silo, you weren't going to be able to make change that was going to be, you know, effective in this sort of new world of of more more speed, more change, more agility, and so forth. So, it you know, looking back on it. Docker is a very hard company to sort of define. I think at the time we were trying to pigeonhole it into one thing or the other. We were kind of trying to figure out like, well, how does this whole, whole sort of open source thing work? And again, this was sort of new to anybody who hadn't really kind of lived in maybe the the Linux world. But if you you know were coming from an infrastructure world, this was sort of the first time some major company was doing stuff as open source. Um, and it seemed like the technology was usable. OpenStack always felt like it was sort of a weird thing. Um, and so, you know, you, you had that coming, going along. And looking back on it again, it's it's kind of weird to put your finger on what Docker was back then versus what Docker is now, which, you know, is very much, you know, a much smaller company, but but much more focused on kind of very, very developer-centric type of experience, developer-centric tooling, developer-centric uh, users and all that sort of stuff. Now, the, the other things we, as we think back upon Docker and, and what we learned from it was, like I mentioned, they were very much trying to be, you know, kind of an open source alternative to something like a VMware, but they were also trying to be an open source, you know, kind of a, an open source thing moving beyond the legacy approach to stuff. But anyways, what what became interesting from a Docker perspective was as much as they talked about community and number of GitHub stars and pulls and downloads, um, you know, one of the things that, that ultimately pushed back on them was because they positioned themselves so strongly kind of as being an anti VMware and because people had, you know, had a, a love for VMware, but also a concern of VMware becoming as big as they were, Docker eventually ran into the problem of, you know, both the community and the customer base was very hesitant to be like, I'm just going to sort of, you know, jump on board with yet another kind of single vendor driven technology base. Right. And so Docker, you know, never really broke free from figuring out like, could you get customers to love you for who you were? Or 
did the community feel like you weren't allowing them to, you know, to, to sort of thrive uh, along with you thriving? So that was one of the things that we've learned is there is a, you know, a distinct concern after having lived through, you know, years of Oracle or years of VMware or years of, of any sort of very large, well-defined, you know, proprietary company, even Microsoft in the, in the office days and so forth. Um, the market is, is, is always hesitant. Now, whether or not that means they, they won't vote with their dollars is always to be determined. But, you know, there was a lot of concern about that. And there was very much a concern in the community of, we are all going to be stuck with this one standard that we're not really getting to contribute to, right? And this is why we had things like people building alternative runtimes to the Docker runtime. So you had OCI and, and we've had lots of shows and I'll put stuff in the show notes. You can go back and listen to all those. So that was that was a distinct thing that happened. The thing I start to wonder from a Docker perspective is Docker ultimately, uh, the original Docker company sort of failed for a couple of reasons. Um, one was they weren't terribly open to their community. Um, number two, they couldn't figure out a business model. And we'll get to the business model piece of this because it's, it's really important. Um, but three, you know, did they need to be open source? And I think there's a lot of companies that are sort of asking that question. And then both companies asking that question, VCs asking that question, and even communities asking that question is like, can we make this sort of yin and yang, this these you know, competing forces of sort of business and business models and open source kind of work together? Um, and I think it's proving to be more and more difficult, especially in a world in which things aren't bootstrapped necessarily. We're seeing large amounts of VC funding, obviously the pressure of VC funding, the timing of VC funding. Um, you know, but I often wonder, could Docker have been as successful as they were, or maybe, you know, maybe their path forward would have been more successful, um, at least longevity wise, if instead of just being open source, they had just been like free with a business model around it, where there was always an option that you could get uh, some variation of the free. And I guess I'm really sort of, you know, looking at, you know, would it be open core? I think that's the, the thing we're sort of asking is, you know, would Docker have been as big as a community? No, absolutely not. Um, but you know, could they have figured out a way to create a standard, create some mechanism in which there were people that were contributing to this standard? Uh, but yet, you know, kind of like VMware, um, Docker could have not had to deal with the problem of like it's open source. Hence, I don't have a business model, and I think that's. If I'm looking back on, on the last 10 years, not just in Docker, but but in all these companies, whether it's HashiCorp or Docker or any of them, um, they've all struggled with this idea of, I want to use open source partially as a community thing. You know, Partially, I have this idea. I want to get it out there. And, and I think Docker kind of wanted to do that. Um, I don't think the Docker team you know, having been a commercial entity before was ever like, hey, we're just doing this altruistically as a charity. I think they were you know, trying to to create a monetized, uh, profitable business model. But we just, in the last 10 years, we just haven't, as a, as a broad swath of technology, we haven't figured out what the right balance is between using open source as a big marketing engine for building a community, for getting people to use the technology, for getting people to kind of contribute to a new standard and finding some way in which the main creator of the technology could make money and then the community could also make money in some way that was deemed fair. And and I think what's interesting is I remember back in the day uh, when Microsoft used to talk about this, Microsoft used to talk about, you know, for every dollar or, you know, however many dollars that Microsoft would make, their their partners, their community would make like $10 or $7 or $8 or something like that. And you know, people could argue whether or not that was ultimately true, but there was a lot of people, a lot of companies that made a bunch of money on top of Microsoft. And VMware used to have the same sort of conversation. VMware would say, well, uh, you know, for every dollar of, of VMware that sold, there was, you know, seven, eight, ten dollars of networking and storage and, you know, underlying compute and new GPUs or CPUs or all sorts of things. And I think somewhere in the last 10 years, that sort of model broke. And I think it was partially because when you were proprietary, you could create an ecosystem model that worked. When you were open, you had no way of controlling 
two things. You couldn't control the demand level of success and the speed at which the VCs wanted their money paid back or some sort of exit. And you couldn't control, you know, whether or not people could, um, you know, ultimately, you know, do what, uh, you know, what HashiCorp has been concerned about. And many have been concerned about is that somebody could basically just take your business, you know, take your technology and, and kind of put you out of business. And so we haven't found that balance. Uh, and I think looking back on it, that's probably over the last 10 years, probably the, the biggest thing that, you know, if you're, if you're looking at the Docker thing, um, success or failure or whatever you way you look at it is they were a poster child for it. Uh, they weren't sort of the only one they were, didn't make the most mistakes or the least mistakes, but, you know, even, even with what they were the foundation of, I mean, they were sort of the foundation of people being like, I'm so concerned about another, you know, infrastructure proprietary thing like VMware that things like the CNCF were created. And, you know, if you look back at the CNCF, I think people thought, okay, the CNCF is going to be this sort of mediator such that we're not going to have proprietariness. But at the same time, you know, the things that have gone into the CNCF, and I don't blame the CNCF for this, is, you know, we just haven't figured out how to get back to, you know, kind of a a business in you know a, a business model, an overall market model in which, um, you know, we we found a balance, right? And we've still had companies that have been wildly successful with this sort of technologies, right? I mean, there's for every MongoDB or Red Hat or AWS or Azure or Google, you know, there's been a whole bunch that that haven't made it. So I mean, I guess we we've still kind of gone back to the model of you know, some big company will will be the the biggest taker of the money. I think what we haven't quite figured out is, you know, how to make the ecosystem around it five, eight, ten times as successful, right? I think that might be the, the biggest thing that sort of fell apart. Um, you know, I think the other part of it, if I think about the Docker thing and I think about a lot of things, I don't know that we've figured out now that we have these sort of blurred lines between infrastructure and app dev. So now we call them DevOps, we call them platform engineering. Um, we also haven't quite figured out what those things mean um, because there hasn't been standards for them. There haven't been, uh, you know, ex- exactly sort of like they all look like this. It's been difficult to, to see certain technologies that, you know, how they fit into these things. So whether it's something like service mesh or, you know, we've talked about, you know, various ways that CI and CD work and so on and so forth. Like the, the in-between technologies, the things that sort of live uh, on the, on the fence between app dev and, and an infrastructure op and security and, you know, deployments and all that sort of stuff have been, you know, challenging to figure out, you know, who should own them, what should they look like? Uh, you know, how do we do it in a standard way that people aren't reinventing the wheel all the time or starting over with them? Um, you know, so I think that's the other part of, of, you know, the looking back on the Docker legacy, and this isn't a, a knock on Docker, but it's, it's sort of the entire industry is that the idea of this sort of microservice pattern or the moving faster pattern, you know, maybe 10 years isn't long enough to figure it out. But, you know, I think there's still a lot of people who are not exactly sure, how to do that. And I don't know that as an industry, we've completely agreed to how to do that. I think we, we fell in love with the idea of like, you know, a hundred deployments in a week or 10 deployments in a day. And there's still plenty of plenty of companies who are like, I I would like to do those things, but like, I'm still struggling to do one release a week or one release in a month or whatever it is. And, you know, while we get Dora statistics or some, some other statistics that say, Hey, there's some companies doing it. I think that's another, you know, look back at the last 10 years that we haven't necessarily necessarily gotten right, if you will. Um, we, we've, we've figured it out in pockets, but we haven't figured it out as a whole. And I think there's a lot of companies that, end user companies that would love for some sort of standardization. And, and I think holistically, we're all sort of at fault for it between, you know, how open source has worked, how vendors have worked, how VCs have worked, how customers have wanted, you know, sort of no lock in and, you know, certain things to be free all the time. And like, we've just sort of, we've created an interesting stew, if you will. Um, last couple of thoughts about the whole, uh, Docker thing is, is I, as, you know, as I think more about this, um, if, you know, if we're going forward with this, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's really, really important. And I remember asking, 
the folks at Docker this back in the days, 13 and 14 and all these sort of things like, how are you guys going to monetize this business? I mean, you stand up on stage at DockerCon and talk about the millions of pull requests and the hundreds of GitOp stars and all these sort of things. Like, how are you going to make money, right? Like you, you keep taking VC funding. How are you going to make money? Uh, you got a big offer from some company to, to acquire you. You decided not to do that. How are you going to make money? And, you know, reading through the article that's in the new stack, um, you know, it it was clearly laid out that A, they didn't really have a monetization model um, that was well-defined. I think they fell in love with the idea that like everybody was coming to their conference and they had done some pretty interesting things technology-wise where they had unlocked some things in new ways. They had kind of figured out a, a minimum viable product in, in essence. They had figured out from the PaaS days to the container days, they'd sort of figured out, oh, PaaS isn't the minimum viable, like container is the minimum viable and maybe it grows into PaaS. But they never figured out a monetization model. And I think they sort of told themselves that if they, and maybe this was VC influence, maybe this was arrogance or whatever it was, I think they told themselves, look at how fast we're growing without a, without a monetization model. Look at some of these offers that we're getting from companies. So Microsoft famously or you know infamously had offered them like $3 billion. Now, whether that actually happened or not, or it was just a news story that, you know, made its way around, you know, they, they, they had it in their mind that, you know, without ever making any money, somebody thought they were worth $3 billion. And so I'm sure there was a certain amount of like, well, gosh, without even trying, we've, we've created this much value. Uh, and if we put a monetization model out there, that's very distinct, people are going to start going, okay, well, let's start counting the numbers. And, you know, maybe that was, maybe they were encouraged to be like, look, if the, the less numbers you have, the, the easier it is for you to sort of create this faux value, uh, however it worked out. But, you know, I think in the world that we live in now, given what we've seen about, you know, open source and open source business models and interest rates and all sorts of stuff, I think it's going to be really important for companies to be not a hundred percent definitive, but, but much more definitive about like, here's how we expect to make business models uh, work. And this is at least what we're going to try. And as I mentioned last week, you know, we haven't quite figured out what they're going to be. I think we're going to, we're going to see some new innovations happening, or we're going to see some new variations on old things with, you know, new approaches to them, whatever they might be. Um, but I think that's probably, and I think the Docker article sort of lays this out. They never, they never figured one out. Uh, they never really wanted to figure one out or they never tried to figure one out. Um, and I'm sure there's a bunch of stories and finger pointing and all sorts of stuff. But, uh, you know, I think if they had started to figure those things out, some of the things in the community may not have happened the way they would have. Just because, you know, when you go from zero to $3 billion valuation without anybody knowing how you're going to make any money, it it freaks people out. And that sort of freaking out probably drove a lot of behaviors that maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, if it had been like, well, it was a... $700 million valuation. Oh, okay. Well, that's, you know, whatever reasonable or whatever, whatever reasonable would mean. So, um, you know, if somebody offers you $3 million, maybe it's a good idea to take it, especially if you don't have any idea what your monetization model is. I'm sure they thought they were, they were great. The last, the last point I'll, I'll point out from that article that, that jumped out at me. And, and it's something that I, I hear from companies all the time. And I constantly having to point out is, you know, they, they made a point that they had a very distinct open source set of people and they had a very distinct group that that the article sort of co calls like those people that wanted to make money or those enterprise money makers or whatever they wanted to do where they you know the the sort of framing is like here's the good freedom fighters over here on one hand and here's the e evil grubby money hungry you know capitalists here on the other hand and i think it's it's great and it's fantastic to write about articles about you know, how you're, how you're doing stuff as a community and all those sort of things. And, and it should never stop anybody. If, if you want to build it as open source, if you want to build it with community, if you want to do those things, but when you start fooling yourself that you have a, a company, you have a business, you have to remind yourself that the purpose of a business, you know, to, to legally incorporate yourself, to take money, uh, to potentially be trusted by customers with your money when you become a business, the purpose of your business is to make money, is to have a monetization model to ultimately make enough money to pay the people that work there, to make more money, you know, to take in more money than, than goes out the door. 
um, at least over some period of time, and to be sustainable and to be profitable. Like that's that is by definition what a business is. And so, you know, I, I always caution the folks who are very happy to work for a business, but believe that they're at the business only for open source and that they're either not really part of the business or they're not really should, shouldn't really be thinking about the monetization of it. Cause at the end of the day, if you align yourself to a business and this isn't a soapbox or anything, the purpose of that business is not open source. If it was open source, it would be a foundation or a charity or some other entity that's goal and purpose, legal reasoning is not to make money. And I think once you are part of a business, a company, a corporation, whatever it is, a partnership, um, I think it's really important to to teach the people at that company that like, yes, even if you are working on the open source stuff, your goal, your your reason for being here is to ultimately be part of helping the company to make money such that the business can be sustainable, which means they pay your salary or they pay your benefits or whatever it is. But you can't have this sort of distinction between we're the, we're the don't make any money people and we are the make money people. Um, you know, if you want to do that, be part of the community, do it in some other way. Um, but I think, you know, I think there's still sort of a, a misconception that has bred out of the last 10 years that, um, you know, that there, there can be some sort of weird, you know, open source, don't worry about how we make money sort of thing. It might not be part directly of your job, but you can't have the mindset of like, I don't want us to make money. I don't care how we make money. Cause at that point, you know, if you do care about your salary, for example, you, you have a mismatch of sort of understanding of, you know, what your purpose is and what the purpose of the business is. Anyways, sort of a long story, uh, sort of a long rant there. Didn't mean it to be a soapbox, but, you know, going, looking back on, on reading the Docker piece of it, that mindset still exists today for many companies, both new companies and established companies. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult balance to find, but for the people that don't understand it, um, you know, they, they run the risk of getting very blindsided at some point. So anyways, I've gone on for a while. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, like I mentioned, uh, this won't be the last Sunday perspective, but next week will be the first Sunday perspective in which it won't just be me. Um, Aaron and I are going to jump on, uh, talk about a bunch of hopefully, uh, good changes, new changes, new things that are coming, uh, to the cloudcast, hopefully to enhance the overall cloudcast experience, what you, uh, what you get. There's a lot of stuff that, uh, Aaron and I have been thinking about for a number of years and it just feels like, uh, now's the right time to, to make some of those changes. So hopefully you enjoyed this show. Hopefully you will tune in next week and hopefully, um, as you listen to next week, uh, you'll give us a bunch of feedback on things because, um, you know, the, the goal is to create a, a better show, a, 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 a show that, that, you know, helps, you know, kind of do what we've done in the Cloudcast for a long time, which is try and make sense of, of all the technology, all the business models, all the things around it. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope you had a great week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for giving us feedback, um, good feedback or bad feedback. Uh, I know we love to ask for, for good feedback. Um, we've gotten some here recently from folks who, you know, sort of said, Hey, you know, I don't, I don't love this about the show. I don't love that. That's great too. That's fine. Um, sometimes it's helpful for us to just get those as emails as opposed to, you know, in the, in the, you know, the, the five star sort of things, but however you want to give us feedback is, is always appreciated. So we thank you for that. So We'll talk to you later. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 